right, so here we are back again. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to to maintain the presentation series on uh, the topic of tiny forests and uh, learning from people who are here again and that you made it, even though, as Chris mentioned, it's uh, Friday evening. So let's jump right into it. Um, just to just to continue or to take on with what we were talking about last time, uh, we ended with a philosophical little lesson or input, and we start with a little philosophical input. So Akira Miyawaki once said, if the end of the world comes tomorrow, I will plant a tree. And this is exactly what we are going to do, even though uh, we shouldn't assume that the end of the world comes tomorrow, but even if we are going to plant trees. So let's go for that. To recap uh, very briefly. So last time we were talking about the tiny forest method based on the Miyawaki, you know, the, the Miyawaki method. And um, we learned that Miyawaki methods require, like that they're very fast growing systems that they mimic like uh, natural so-called climax forest ecosystems. We saw many examples from places all around the world where Miyawaki forests have been implemented successfully. And um, yeah, we learned a little bit like we saw this graph last time already, but uh, we take it as a basis to start to start today's lesson. Um, so we talked about the different steps of the implementation, which are first, like, becoming aware of the soil situation. So is it either a sandy or clay soil and uh, how's the humus content, how's the water holding capacity and so on. Uh, we take a look at the species, so which species are native. We learned about the potential natural vegetation um, and that we should, in best case, use mostly this, this species, which would naturally, without human inter interference, would uh, build the local climax ecosystem. Then the next step of the implementation would be the soil engineering. So um, yeah, adding additives like local biomass into the soil to increase the humus content, the um, uh, microbiological activity in the soil, the availability of nutrition, the water holding capacity, um, and to yeah to bring bring air into the soil to loosen the soil to uh, create aerobic uh, aerobic situation. Then we plan to dance. Why we do it? We also discussed that we try to mimic the natural regeneration processes uh, that nature and old growth forests. Um, yeah, how, how they regenerate. So we saw the pictures of. A tiny forest we planted as an example and then a picture a photo of the natural regeneration where we saw that um, on one square meter in a european natural forest there were like 30 to 40 seedlings uh, per square meter starting the race for light um, so we yeah, are with a dense plantation we try to mimic this natural process and uh, we also learned that after two or three years of caretaking, we created a self-sustaining forest, which then doesn't need a lot of care anymore, and which develops within a period of 25 to 30 years into a um, in, into a quasi climax forest ecosystem, which has the same ecological functions, the same complexity, and uh, the same resilience for, yeah, against uh, calamities like, like storm, like bark beetle, uh, like uh, temperature variations, drought, and so on. So going a little bit deep, deeper now into the project management, like we go now deeper level by level to make it more and more clear how this implementation process actually works. Um, so the first step, just briefly 
um, like firstly in a box, the soil analysis. So in the beginning, we take a close look at the locations and um, like here on the picture, you see how this in real life looks like. This is, uh, this is an area at a kindergarten in Frankfurt, but the Frankfurt and Brandenburg, more or less close to Berlin, where we have the situation uh, that it's like a, kind of a meadow, which in the summer gets really burned. So the soil is only sandy, it's really dry. Um, there's no vegetation growing here. And as you can see on this on this picture, like uh, my my colleague is digging out like this really, yeah, this really dry, sandy soil. you you don't see any dark, compost like uh, materials so the humus content is probably only when we look at it we can assume that the humus content and the microbiological activity of this location is very very low so uh, what we want to find out with the soil analyze analysis is what nutritions are already available here are there already earthworms or other signs of life this is also what we can just check with our eyes and brains uh, are trees or other plants already already growing here so we see in the back there are some trees this is uh, i think this is like kind of a acacia uh, non-native tree pioneer tree uh, nitrogen fixing but yeah it fulfills quite a good function and the other is arthur uh, acer tree a native tree also kind of pioneer um, but yeah, on the on the site we where we are going to plant in this example, there is almost no vegetation directly, but some roots which might support the system later and which might spend uh, shadow at certain times of the day during the day. Um, what's really important when we analyze the stand in general is are there pipes or other infrastructure in the ground, like for electricity, for example, and how deep do they lay? So usually the owner of the area um, should have plans and could provide information about that. Usually when you are in a rural area, this won't be a topic, but when you are in a more urban area, uh, you should really be aware that there might be some infrastructure in the ground and uh, you don't want to go with an excavator to the to the site and destroy any critical infrastructure because they're going to be expensive and um, yeah so make sure you check that before and um, yeah once you analyze the stand and later later i will also show like uh, different approaches like for example only analyzing it uh, in in the field with your eyes and hands or you can send your uh, soil samples to a laboratory and get like uh, specific values and uh, how this analyze protocol looks like we i show later but yeah, once you've done it, you can exactly decide what to have been, yeah, what you want to do there in order to regenerate the soil properly. The next step is a plant selection. So depending on the location you select, you want to, uh, yeah, you want to select suitable trees and shrubs for the tiny forest. And you want to make sure that you plant trees that are well adapted to the conditions there. So, uh, yeah, you need a little bit of ecological knowledge. You have to do some research. You have to observe the surrounding areas. You have to talk to uh, experts of the regions. Um, what, we, what we want is that our tiny forest should have the highest possible biodiversity. So um, besides like the dominating trees of the potential natural vegetation, we want to uh, select as much species as possible which possibly could grow on this area in order to yeah to to increase the chances that a lot of species of the ones we selected will form uh, this complex system which is hopefully very resistant to climatical changes droughts and so on um yeah and most species should be native but foreign species can also be used and we will discuss this later in more detail 
the soil preparation. So on this picture, we see the same area, but in autumn, um, we saw on the, for the first step. So in this case, we added uh, compost and biochar, the, the properties of the specific soil additives we are going to discuss later as well. But just to get an idea how the soil preparation process can look like. So here we have a mini excavator which is quite cheap and uh, for area of 200, 300, 400 square meters, you generally need with this machine, depending on what you're going to do one or two days in order to bring some uh, humus rich material into the topsoil. In this case, uh, the material which you see now here, the dark, um, the dark compost is going to be mixed with the topsoil layer, maybe until the depth of I don't know, 40 centimeters more or less. So what we want to do is we want to build, uh, especially a nutrient-rich topsoil, um, yeah, different additives like uh, biochar, compost, leaves, fungal spores, manure, and other substrates uh, can be used. And yeah, obviously the aim is to create a good basis for healthy plant growth and soil life. Because yeah, as we learned, I think already last time that the biodiversity in the soil, like the invisible biodiversity is kind of the basis for a stable and diverse ecosystem above ground, which you can see. Next step is the planting day. So this is what we are all uh, looking forward to. When we came to this point that we only have to organize the planting day, um anymore and the rest is done almost nothing can go wrong so uh, when we made it until here it's uh, already a very very great success so yeah together with your local community or your group you're going to uh, organize this ev event which hopefully is going to be designed in a way that Everyone has a very great experience and there's a lot of room for exchange, for having fun. And uh, yeah, just remember this day as, a, as something very positive. Um, depending on the group, teachers, parents, children, the local community, everyone comes together and everyone is planting for this greater mission uh, of doing something good for nature, for the biosphere, for the neighborhood. And within one or two days, depending on the size of the area, a tiny forest is, is created, um, yeah, which from then on will enrich the lives of the people who are living there and be a place for, uh, for research, for learning and for recreation. Then another important thing is the caretaking. Um, so within the first three years, a tiny forest needs at least a bit of maintenance. Um, in the final chapter, I think we will talk about this next time. But um, yeah, we have a very clear introduction. Of, yeah, yeah, like introduction, how exactly to maintain a tiny forest and how to how to understand which kind of weeding is necessary and which herbs and uh, plants can remain within the system and how exactly you determine how much water is needed when. But yeah, in general, the caretake caretaking within the first three years, um, uh, the watering and the removing of weeds which overgrow the seedlings we planted and yeah, the care instructions. Uh, you will you will also get all the information, by the way, as uh, PDF documents to read topic by topic, like the, the important things. And the last point is a resilient, small, diverse forest. So after three years, you hardly have to do anything. The forest now keeps itself alive. Um, as you can see from this picture, like this is uh, actually the first Miyawaki forest we planted, and um, yes, it's kind of our our 
baby. So I have a very strong relationship to this little forest. And this is a picture, I think it was taken after two and a half years, roughly, as you can see by the different shapes of the leaves. Um, it's I think only on this picture, you can see up to 10 different tree and shrub species. And what, what illustrates this picture is how dense the system is, how diverse, and also you can imagine that there's almost no sun penetrating to the ground because the ground is totally covered with, um, yeah, with biomass, with plants and covered by the leaves. So there's almost uh, no, no water evaporating, like the soil is not drying out, but um, yeah, the forest and the canopy layer is already closed and holds a lot of water in the system. And from this point on, you don't have to do weeding, you don't have to do watering because the system is going to, uh, to be functional on itself. Uh, what you can do then is enjoy the variety of butterflies, bugs and birds. So I can say from uh, our experience, I don't know exactly how the situation will be in Gozo, but uh, once you created a little oasis like this, nature will be very thankful and it's going to be a very nice feeling after three, four years to sit in the middle of it and see uh, yeah, how many little creatures are using this forest you planted as a habitat. And a little advice, so be curious and explore the tiny forest with all your senses. There is so much to learn. So uh, yeah, this is also a point like we, many people pretend that we know so much about nature and ecosystems already, but there's there are so many thing, things everyone can explore, like so many things to observe which haven't been observed before or yeah, so many things to be curious about that it's only a recommendation. When you have a little forest, you plant it in front of your door, go out, check out which uh, insects and um, yeah, little animals are coming there and what what things you might see, which could be interesting for other people and talk about it, exchange about it, try to explain different phenomena you observe. So these were the five or six points, including the final result um, in a box briefly, um, briefly explained. And now we're going to go into each of the topics more in detail. And we start with the planning of the plant, so the plant selection. What is important when we, uh, when we are trying to create our planting list are different, uh, I, I, can, I divide it in two categories, like the specific location, <clears throat> but also our, our focus, like, um, yeah, let's start with the location. So there are different parameters which are important in this in this sense, which are, for example, first of all, the uh, dynamics of light and shadow. So are there, when there are already buildings next to the site or when there are already trees and shrubs, you are going to have shadow on the site uh, for some hours a day. <clears throat> if there's nothing, you obviously are going to have only sun. So make sure that you know how light and shadow will uh, will be on your area in order to select your plants wisely. Then the second important thing is water. So um, one thing is the ground level of water. So yeah, you, you can find find data <clears throat> when you, for example, the local authorities, I don't know how it's exactly in Gozo, but there should be one institute or you know, you, there should be a data available where in your specific location the ground water level is. And yeah, this gives you a clue how deep the trees and uh, shrubs have to penetrate with their roots into the ground until they have uh, they they have always access to water. The other thing to water is the rainfall. So analyze your climate data and see in which seasons how much rain is going to fall. 
and yeah obviously the groundwater won't be only some centimeters or half a meter but going to be very very deep so what we want is we want to improve our soil in a way that the soil itself can hold water that it's not like dry and crusty and water just rains on the soil and then uh, and then flows away but we want as much water as possible when we have heavy rainfalls during the rainy seasons to penetrate into the ground and to stay in the ground and not you know like in a sandy soil for example the water will just wash out um yeah so how is the water situation is beside the light the second most important aspect then as we already talked about the existing vegetation so um for example if there is one big tree which uh, produces a lot of seeds which fall on the ground and then produce seedlings then probably on our side this tree will regenerate itself so we don't have to buy or organize this specific tree because it will generate itself anyway um, what is also important is that we have a bigger tree next to our area we don't want to destroy its roots when we uh, try to improve the soil so as an example like we we always think in terms of mm, we have a big big tree next to our side and the projection of the crown area like when we when we are projecting the crown area on the ground is the is the area where we won't dig anything where we protect the roots of this existing tree so um make sure that you yeah um, with your approach to improve the soil and you plant a tiny forest you don't destroy existing vegetation this is very important but but more to intelligently integrate the existing vegetation into your system and use it as um, yeah as a support or as an existing structure for your system <clears throat> and another point is heating by buildings and uh, or if the if the area is even if there's even ceiling, I don't know if this might be a possible case in Gozo, but uh, yeah, just in general, especially the heating by buildings and cities is an important aspect. So when um, through like a very, very, when we are in the city center and buildings are very densely constructed there, there might be no flow of wind, so no air circulating and uh, cooling down the side. And then buildings like concrete and glass windows and everything are heating up and making the area in general maybe two, three, four degrees warmer than um, your location, like comparable locations outside of the city or yeah, in, in other locations. So um, we can't in this, when, when the situation is like uh, very much warmer than it would be outside of the city, like really very much warmer, then the potential natural vegetation can't be used. Uh, yeah, because it's a concept where we consider that humans uh, wouldn't interfere. So keep that in mind really depends on on the specific site and uh, as i mentioned last time as soon as we know the specific site i can give more uh, more specific recommendations on how to select the plants and prepare the soil and so on um, beside the location characteristics there's also the, the other point is the focus so we humans or the we as a group who are planning this miyawaki forest this project we probably have a certain objective and uh, stakeholders involved i mean since they are going to take care of this forest and they implemented probably in the neighborhood um, it's important to consider or to integrate their objective into the planning um, and just to give you a few examples is our objective could be 
uh, to increase biodiversity and maybe to promote certain uh, endangered species of birds or insects. And then we would see, OK, I want to support this specific bird and this bird needs this tree. And therefore, I have to create a system where this tree feels well, um, just as an example. Or we want to um, set our focus on the food forest system, that we want to have a stable forest system with a maximum of edible trees and shrubs. And these work best in the, in the forest edge zone. So later I also show you an example of um, how I planned a recent project where we implemented um, an island of a classical Miyawaki forest with a potential natural vegetation. And then in the edge zone, we created something like a forest garden with native and non-native nut trees and uh, things like apple trees and uh, peaches and other shrubs. So the focus could also be like an edible character. Um, and another thing which uh, can be interesting, and we as an organization are currently also planning the design of a research forest, which is not using native trees, but we try to create a, an experimental new kind of ecosystem with climate trees and species from, from other regions, for example, from South Europe, from Japan, from the US, um, where we try to yeah, integrate new, new species in our systems. So this might also be an um, approach like or a, an open question. Do you only want to use native trees or is it possible to use non-native trees, which non-native native trees um, are promising and in which percentage you want to integrate them into your, uh, into your planting list? Um, when you want to find out what your potential natural vegetation is, uh, yeah, first, like a very interesting indicator besides just going into the literature immediately is to find a natural and healthy forest in your area and then do, to detect all the species. And here, it's quite a while ago since I prepared this presentation, but on this picture, and uh, people from Gozo might know this uh, is an example of kind of a native and functional forest in Gozo, which are based on my research, very, very rare. Um, but there are still examples where you could go and check out like, yeah, what can you observe? And especially like in the sense of plant selection, which plants are growing there, which plants are performing well and uh, then to identify them and yeah you can do it with a local ecologist or with uh, with an ecology like plant identifying book or i mean today we can also do it quite accurate for most species with an app so this would be the first thing i would recommend like doing your old field your own field research the second thing is look into the literature, which plants used to be native before human influence, because some trees and species where we currently, uh, which we are very used to see, are not really native. I mean, when they are performing well, they are very much suitable for our, our forest system, probably. But it's interesting to see what would be the um, yeah, how would be the land cover in general on the region where we want to implement a forest? Has there been a lot of forest in the past or maybe another ecosystem would be the climax ecosystem, then it would be even considerable to think about if a forest is really the like the proper ecosystem to install here. But in many, many areas, um, we are without human interference, the climax ecosystem would be a forest. And yeah, find out um, which species would be would be would have been or uh, were dominant then back then. Um, once you've done that, find a local ecologist uh, and 
talk with him or her about species that are native in the region and also about the species which are performing well even though they are not native because they might also be very very interesting for us in our planning and also <clears throat> take a close look at uh, climate predictions uh, because depending where you are i mean predictions are always predictions and uh, we don't know if i mean there are different models of the future and uh, yeah we can't be sure how exactly things will develop but it's very good in general to look at your specific site and your region and see whether it's going to be like probably pretty much drier pretty much hotter or if the changes are predicted to be just you know, slightly drier and slightly warmer just in order to think about um to, to think about the possibility, as I talked about before, to integrate non-native species into your system, which might perform well when the situation is going to change a little more dramatically. Yeah, so some general information to Gozo. This is based on my quick research, but uh, I think especially for the Germans who uh, maybe didn't have the time for for this research it might be very very useful and i think like next week or one other one other lecture they will also talk i always forget the second name but um the local ecologist louis so uh, he are going he's probably going to tell you a lot of uh, more specific information about the history of vegetation in Gozo and the native trees and so on. But I want to give you a brief overview. So uh, that Malta and also Gozo was largely covered by evergreen forests of uh, holm oak and Aleppo pines. And these have gradually declined due to human activities. So. Uh, yeah, as you guys from Gozo can probably confirm, uh, the island, I also looked at uh, Google Earth data, so it's mostly not covered in evergreen forests anymore. And yeah, as I said, like the forests have almost disappeared, and which I found really alarming that uh, only 25 holm oaks are remaining across the whole island. So. Uh, tree species like a very nice tree species which have been native and dominant and really formed the landscape and the ecosystem is now has now been reduced to only 25 individuals so it's really time to support the species and bringing it back um yeah there are only a few natural forests or human planted wooded areas uh, ah, and the, the picture I showed you was this uh, area called Basket Gardens. So you might look that up on, on Google. Uh, yeah, and this area, Basket Gardens, is a significant semi-natural wooded area. Uh, it's in Malta, but close to Gozo, so it's probably pretty much a good reference. And it consists of Aleppo pines, olive trees, holm oaks, and other plant species. So a diverse and multi-species semi-natural forest, which is a very good reference for what, what you are going to do. Um, and what I also found out is that there are criticisms uh, aimed at government attempts to use non-native species like eucalyptus and acacia for reforestation. So this is something we observe in so many areas that there, like there's political will to reforest areas rapidly with fast-growing non-native or non-adapted species for a specific site. Um, current, we are, have also a current project in Morocco, uh, which is maybe a quite interesting story to tell. Where also the government, like on an area like very hilly site, which has been only 40 years ago been a native a beautiful native forest 
um, which had been deforested completely. And then the government tried to install monocultures of eucalyptus, which started to perform well in the first 10 years, and then they all died and the area looks terrible. So uh, this is something, or also in Germany, another little story maybe, where I live in the area around Berlin, like, like most parts of Eastern Germany, actually, uh, well, after World War II, we had to pay uh, war debt to Russia mostly. And since Germany didn't have a lot of money, they also gave gave away a lot of wood. So they deforested um, valuable valuable natural forests. And then on the sandy soils, they replanted uh pine pine trees so the situation now is that you only see these pine monocultures and now they're uh, they are all dying and are really in a bad shape because of uh yeah they're they're damaged by fire by bark beetle and um so this is something which is not only uh, has has not only happened in Gozo or Malta, but it happened all around the world and everywhere. So these government efforts to reforest fastly uh, without any ecological knowledge uh, is a very common thing. And yeah, the solution is that really more scientific, science-based uh, approaches start to take place. And um, yeah, in order to regenerate or to bring back real natural forests. Um, just to name some important species, you can just look up, look it up later. Uh, but this might be a good orientation in the beginning of your research. Um, yeah, you can you can do some research on all these trees, but these are just the important species which I found uh, which could be useful um, and suitable for the planning of your Miyawaki forest uh, in a tree layer, uh, as already mentioned, home oak, Aleppo pine, the olive tree and the carob tree. And then there are a bunch of shrubs, um, which most of them I don't, I don't really know. So it's yeah, definitely a very different ecosystem of the ecosystems uh, I am currently planning, but I would be very excited to see with which uh, tree list, species list you come up in the end and uh, which, which other species you might identify and how they are going to perform in this mixed system with uh, well-prepared soil. So <clears throat> this time I give some guiding questions uh, to you. In the end, I will have some more questions or a summary and yeah, anyway, you will get this presentation. But for this step one, plant selection, some guiding questions. So firstly, which other native trees besides the ones I showed you and shrub species exist in Gozo? And also very important, can you buy them somewhere? And if so, where? Or alternatively, can you get uh, seeds somewhere to, uh, uh, to grow the seedlings yourself? Which are the pioneer species? Also very important. Uh, I think in the first lecture with Kaspar, you learned a little bit more specific what pioneer species actually are, um, because these are the ones which might also be successful in a little bit more difficult situations, not so good soil. And uh, if you integrate them into your system, they are probably going to grow uh, fast and high in the beginning and might provide the shade for, for example, home or oak or other species which need a more shady situation because they are climax species and uh, used to grow under a layer of pioneer species. So um, to start growing under a layer of pioneer species. So which are these species and where can you find them? Also important, at least for our systems here in, um, in Germany or middle Europe, which nitrogen fixing species are available as support tree species. So especially in the beginning of this um, 
of the process of a young system becoming a forest. Um, nitrogen, which is available for the plants, can be uh, quite a, an important factor. And there are certain tree species uh, from the family of Fabaceae, mostly, which have the um, which have the ability to fix nitrogen from the air, from the atmosphere, like the air in the soil, with the help of certain bacteria, which with which they live in symbiosis in the root zone, and um, they might be very interesting in order to support the system. So when you have uh, any nitrogen fixing species, find out uh, which they are and if you can get them. Next question, which non-native species might fit into the system? So we talked a little bit about it and this is probably a question where uh, Professor Louis might help you out. And uh, also very important, which species should not be used? So, for example, is it recommendable to use eucalyptus as the government has done? Or is it really a bad idea? Because usually eucalyptus is a species which um, suppresses the growth of other trees. And there might be some other either invasive trees or trees which are currently used, but uh, not beneficial for a native natural forest system. So make sure that you identify them and make sure that they don't end up into your planting list. And also a point which edible plants could be added. So from my point of view, uh, when we have edible plants, which we can integrate in the forest edge zones, like uh, yeah, shrubs, berries, nuts, and so on, um, we add one more ecosystem services to uh, anyway functional forest ecosystem and the relationship between the people who planted it or the people uh, in the neighborhood with the forest will be even higher when the forest provides uh, food or snacks for them. So it's an interesting idea I find to use the forest edge zone for edible plants. When you're now really creating your planting list, um, I think we talked about this earlier, but yeah, the planting should be dense. So we plant in general three to five, but usually three plants per square meter. Um, depending on the site, <clears throat> the distribution like in percentage might vary, but usually like as a basic orientation, we divide the species we have into three layers, the canopy layer, the small, smaller tree layer, and the shrub layer. And then we try to have uh, one third of all trees be canopy trees, one third be small trees, and one third be shrub trees. Depending on the site condition, the percentage could vary. For example, if we have, if we have a shady, uh, situation, then we can could add more canopy trees initially. Um, in other situations, it might go a little bit more in the other direction, but this is, I think, a good orientation with which you can work. And uh, examples of how to make a planting list, like um, an Excel sheet, like an open Excel sheet, uh, we will provide in the materials which I'm going to send or share or share in a cloud. I don't know I will make this, I'll talk about this with Christian. Um, yeah, and here you see, I mean, this is from Germany, you can't use this planting list, but just as an example, how we, uh, how we create a planting list. So you see, we have the scientific name and the name in the German, we have the number of individuals, we have the category, and we have also the site conditions. Like for example, is this, uh, is this tree, does it need shade? Is it shade tolerant? Does it need sun? Does it, uh, yeah. So which sun and light situation this uh, specific tree needs? And yeah, with this list, we start our research. In Germany, it's very easy. Usually we send it to, uh, to one or two three nurseries and they are going to have everything and go though it might be more difficult. But just as an orientation, this is how uh, 
uh, your planting list could look like. All right, so then the second point, soil planning. Yeah, I think we finished soil planning and then we have a little room for further organization and discussion and then we are already done for today, but this is a very crucial part. So um, first of all, the guiding question, what should be the soil like in your location? Um, and I give you an example. Here, here's a picture of one type of soil in Gozo. You, so you see this, uh, and this is from, from a forest or from a, an area with, with a good vegetation. You see on the left here, a bigger root. You see some vegetation cover, and you can see uh, on, uh, might be 10 centimeters of dark humus rich topsoil. And below <clears throat> is this uh, red, more clay soil. But probably like this, this might be a guiding image of this, how our soil could look like. But um, and also in the expert in the other lecture, we'll talk about the different soil types uh, of Gozo in more detail, because I think there are four, five, six different soil types, which vary a little bit in their um uh composition um yeah but in general like the current soil composition in malta slash gozo uh, most soils there have a ph value above eight this is very interesting because it's different like in uh, middle europe the ph just for those who don't know that like a low ph value would be very sour, like a lemon, for example, and a very high pH value would be uh, alkaline, so like soap, for example. And the neutral, neutral pH lies at seven, so seven is right in the middle. Um, and in Germany, for example, most soils vary between five and seven, so they are neutral to slightly sour. And in Gozo, most soils are a little bit more alkaline, like a little bit more soap-like. Um, so not yeah, neutral to uh, alkaline. And uh, this is like due to the uh, yeah, geological materials and just uh, yeah, the chemistry of the minerals, the mineral soil. Um, there, oh yeah, here, here I've written it. There are three main soil types, like young, carbonatic, raw soils with a very low humus content, um, older soils with moderate humus content, and the oldest fossil uh, soils like Terra Rosa and uh, Terra Fusca with higher humus content. Humus content like uh, four point five percent. Uh, this is already like for for these uh, drier southern areas, quite high humus content, even though that in um, in middle European, European old growth beech forest, for example, the humus content could be like 15% or 20%. Um, what is really important to have in mind in Gozo is that the soils, they dry out in summer and get very hard. This doesn't happen when they have a vegetation cover, because we talked about this a lot. Um, <clears throat> when the soil can't shine directly on the raw, uh, when the sun can't shine directly on the raw soil, um, and the soil is protected by a canopy layer, then a mulch layer from all the leaves and branches on top of the soil, and then the top soil has a high humus content, which can hold water and where, uh, yeah, insects and uh, bacteria and fungus are circulating water and uh, nutrition, then the, our soils won't get so dry and hard anymore. But on, uh, yeah, on areas with no vegetation cover, this is the situation. And we should be very much aware about this because, uh, yeah, especially in the first years after the planting, our, even though we mulch and we, um, increase the humus content in the soil, we still might have the situation that our soils start to dry out because we don't have uh, the trees 
mature enough to really protect the soil and uh, to really hold water in their root zone when the roots are not that developed already. Um, for the soil planning and um, for the soil uh, for the soil preparation, we need to do an analysis. And this analysis contains of certain steps. So step one, I mentioned this already in our in the little introduction. Um, are there cables, wires, or any other underground infrastructure? So uh, there might be an office, an institution, um, or a property owner with the plans of the area. And um, yeah, <clears throat> you should have uh, permission to work on this area. So uh, if it's if it really possible to dig there and uh, to go with an excavator uh, in order to uh, yeah open up the soil and mix in other local biomass. Um, and once this is done, once you're sure that you can uh, you can use this area and there's no uh, underground infrastructure, <coughs> then you can. Uh, continue with your planning. This is something you should check right in the beginning, actually. Um, and step two would be find out the type of soil. So in order to do this, you should dig at least one hole or some more holes distributed throughout the area. And um, we are recommending now, since we have made some experiences where we didn't dig enough or at uh, not enough locations, uh, that you definitely you should try when the soil is not too hard to dig or drill a hole of at least 50 to 100 centimeters. Um, and then to get the material out and um, yeah, take samples from the topsoil, like around about 10 centimeters depth and one of the subsoil, so around 50, could be 80, could be 40, but something in this range, like uh, take another sample. And when you want to do it very well, what I recommend, I mean, you could also do it um, without a very accurate soil sampling, but what I recommend in order to have data from the beginning, uh, with which you can also compare uh, the development of the system afterwards, uh, you can send the samples to a soil lab. And you want to know, like best case in the end, uh, you find out the following values. Just the soil type, this just means, uh, is it a uh, clay or a sandy soil or something in between? You want to find out the pH value and what that is, uh, we talked about a second ago. Then there are the three, the three main nutritions, which are important for plant growth, which are, we call it shortly NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, okay, here, this is, this is the ger German, it would be calcium in English, it's potassium. Um, you want to find out the humus content. So, yeah, and also here <clears throat> I translated some of the some of the slides um, only rapidly from uh, German to English. So here is written the target would be of the humus content above five percent. We just learned that also the natural soils in Gozo have uh, have humus contents lower than 5% naturally. So um, yeah, you might check this out and see that you just try to mimic or recreate a natural situation, which is, uh, yeah, which is uh, typical for Gozo. And <clears throat> another thing would be the CN ratio. So the CN ratio means the ratio between carbon in the soil and nitrogen. Um, I won't go too deep into soil science, but um, carbon ends up when leaves or branches die and fall to the ground. Then we have like kind of free carbon and this carbon is going to be decomposed um, by microorganisms. 
And these microorganisms who are eating and decomposing the carbon and making humus out of it, they need for their body structure, they need nitrogen from the soil. Um, and when this CN ratio isn't in balance, then, um, then for example, the carbon can't be decomposed by the um, uh, microorganisms and we don't have like a, a nutrition flow and we don't have a healthy circular situation. So, um, I don't. I don't know. It's not. It's not always super super important um, to um, you know. The more the more parameters or values you are aware about, the more you is going to be tricky for your mind. And usually, with with some biomass in the soil and uh, native densely planted trees and some watering, everything should work out fine. But it's an interesting value like the CN and. It usually should. Maybe you can discuss it also with uh, with local experts. But um, in Middle Europe, a good CN value would be about 25 to 1. And when you analyze the soil and it's very, very different, maybe discuss the result and see because the consequence would be uh, either to add uh, not so much uh, mulch material because mulch contains a lot of carbon and not a lot of and, uh, not much of nitrogen so it, it might influence your decision of the biomass the kind of biomass and the uh, volume of biomass you're going to add into the soil <clears throat> and here we see an example of the laboratory results and again it looks all very scientific uh, but it's it's no rocket science uh, first of all you can uh, yeah, you can just um, check out. I think for the Germans, I also gave a video recommendation for a very, very easy soil science uh, video course on YouTube. Um, so it's actually not too difficult. And you could also plan your forest, as I mentioned before, without these uh, lab results. But especially when it's interesting to do some citizen science and uh, since it's a pilot project in Gozo, like the first tiny or Miyawaki forest in Gozo, it might be interesting to get this data and uh, to do analyzes maybe in uh, five years and 10 years and 20 years and see how all the parameters changed because it might be uh, interesting arguments also for uh, decision makers in, poli in politics and so on. Um, and also interesting data for universities to, uh, yeah, to uh, to discuss or to write papers about. So this is, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry for the ones who don't understand English, but very briefly, uh, this is how such an analysis might look like. So here, the first green arrow describes the kind of soil. So you will get the result whether it's a <clears throat> Uh, it's a sand or a clay here here it's a it's a slightly clay sand so um, you get this information very detailed <clears throat> here you see the ph value and then also um i'd say uh yeah the a category whether it's it's a lot or it's in the optimum or it's too less or too low. So in this case, the, the pH is uh, almost seven and uh, should have been around, around six. So it's a little bit high. Uh, here at the next arrow, we see the humus content. So it was only 1.9%. So it's a very low class of humus content. Um, just to give you an overview how such an, an analysis is constructed and looks like. Yeah, as I already mentioned, um, when you analyze the soil, check out groundwater level and rain. So yeah, I won't talk about this too much anymore. And what is also interesting is uh, when you dig a hole, when you're able to dig a hole, or at least when the excavator comes, um, check out the soil profile. 
So I think in one of the first lectures, you probably also saw this graph, just how this um, how the, for, uh, the soil type is determined by the different layers and the thickness of layers. And um, it's also very interesting to make photos before and after, and also later maybe take a, another uh, profile after five years, um, five years after implementation, and really compare how the layers develop because um, once you brought biomass uh, compost, for example, into the top layer, um, it might be through a process which we call, uh, oh, what is it in English, bioturbation, bioturbation, I know, like when worms and other, uh, other beings in the soil uh, start to distribute and uh, circulate nutrition in the soil and bring it to deeper layers and bring it up to higher layers again. Um, and also rainwater is going to wash out uh, materials we added into the top soil and wash it out down. So after a while, we're going to see how the initial input we gave uh, actually is coming together when natural influences um, start to work. And so it's going to be interesting results to see the profile in the beginning and uh, after some years of the forest development. And yeah, here, as I mentioned, document all your findings. I really want to engage uh, or motivate everyone to not only plant, plant this forest, but also to engage in citizen science because everyone can find out interesting things and um, yeah, write little papers or, for example, send our organization. Uh, we are always very happy to receive emails with uh, questions or with interesting findings and results. All right. Yeah, I think I'm going to continue a little bit. Maybe we can make it to, um, yeah, we can make it and finish this soil chapter, which sometimes seems to be the most boring chapter or difficult chapter, but in the end, it's, it is not too much, but uh, also in university, I didn't like soil science so much. It starts to become interesting when you're really working with the soil and when you see different situations and see your plants perform on different types of soils. Um, one soil additive with which we are working a lot in Germany, I think I mentioned it last time, which might be difficult to, uh, to buy in Gozo, which it might be possible to produce it yourself. Um, I put a YouTube link here. I think I also uh, send it to Christian and he sent it to you after the last lecture. Um, just just to mention, it's not it's not a, a must have, but it might be interesting, especially on uh, where the conditions are very dry and where soil is very compacted. Um, like the topic biochar. Biochar describes uh, carbonized uh, biomass from wood or other um, other local biological like, like plant material, which is waste material, which is then carbonized, so burned under uh, conditions without without oxygen. So in the end, we receive these, uh, like, like you see on the top left here in this picture, these carbon structures, which are more or less like a sponge. And the sponge has certain, uh, certain abilities, which are like one ton of this biochar stores about three tons of carbon or CO2 equivalent. Uh, and it's going to stay stable in the ground for at least 1000 years, roughly. So it's an interesting thing to, uh, yeah, to store carbon or remove carbon from the atmosphere. And when we're talking about the influence of uh, CO2 to the climate change, it might be one factor, like one of many factors, but uh, it's an inter interesting thing, um, which is very, very interesting. I find is that uh, one gram of this biochar has a surface of over 300 square meters. So uh, it's really hard to imagine, but when you see this picture and you start to, uh, if you would measure like uh, all the surface also in these little holes, 
Um, yeah, maybe maybe you can imagine it somehow. And um, this high surface brings some properties, which are that uh, this biochar can store up to five times its own weight in water. So you can imagine when we have, I don't know, one ton of uh, this charcoal in our soil, it can hold five tons of water, which uh, stays there, like due to the structure, the water is going to stay there until, for example, the root of a plant comes and needs it and uh, sucks it away. So uh, this is like, the, from my point of view, the most beneficial property. Um, but also <clears throat> due to this uh, high surface, nutritions are uh, like can like easily said they they bind to these structures and like with water when the plants or microorganisms need the nutritions they um, yeah they are going to they they can take it from there it's like like a trading point so to say like uh, the structure holds nutrition which uh, come to the structure and then yeah living beings have access to this nutrition <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah and also like this little the sponge structure gives a lot of room for habitat of bacteria and fungus so it increases the soil microbiology um, biodiversity uh, dramatically so very interesting thing and it's in Germany there there are like some first pilot industrial uh, uh, fabrics where you can you can buy these products in a large scale but you can also easily do it yourself when you have some local biomass like wood waste um and as i said like there's a very nice youtube video where can, where you find um instructions for that <clears throat> another thing which is probably the most suitable um product for a biomass for your project uh compost or manure like on the top we see compost and i think we talked about what compost is like uh, when your local, uh, like like your, uh, how to say, like your your biological kitchen waste, mm, I don't know. Some people produce their own compost in their garden, or um, like the, we have, you have a local waste management where the waste gets uh, gets distributed, and the all the organic waste is going to be decomposed. So they produce compost out of it. Uh, so it's really biological material which uh, becomes humus uh, or hum a very humus rich dark soil which is yeah, rich in nutrients rich in microbiology and this is probably the the easiest thing to add to the soil in order to uh, to reach the the soil properties we want to have right from the beginning and manure is yeah the the shit of horse or cow or uh, any other grass or plant eating animal which also has to lay for a while and decompose and after some some month uh, it also going to have similar properties like the compost um, and as i said like this either one of these or both should later mix and be mixed into the topsoil in a proportion that I'm going to share later. Um, and they will increase the nutrient availability of these N, P, and K uh, I was talking about earlier. It increases also the water holding capacity. Uh, it increases the micro microbial activity and it builds up humus. So um, yeah. The, exactly the properties we want to we want to have we want, we want to give to the soil uh, important to mention is that when you're using manure don't use fresh manure it should be at least one year old because there are still processes taking place and um, some some ammonium is going to be washed out which might be um, bad for the roots of the plants so make sure it has been laying for a while then it's very a very good additive for the soil.
Um, <clears throat> another thing, especially for very compacted soils, is just some kind of fluffy biomass like uh, straw or rice shells or coconut, uh, shredded coconut shells or whatever is available um, on your site. And they will enrich the soil with carbon. So as they decompose, they give carbon to the system. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you bring a biomass like this in the system, you should make sure that there's also nitrogen, which you bring into the system. And uh, you would do that, for example, with compost. Um, yeah, these materials or these biomasses are especially interesting for the aeration of loamy or clay soils so that we bring air into the soil so we we would loosen with the excavator this clay loamy soil um, and mix in this biomass so uh, with the biomass inside now the soil won't be that compacted again and wherever like this this biomass is roots can penetrate through and uh, there's a little pocket of air um, it's also good for the, yeah, as I said, like rootability. I don't know, it's an auto translator if this is really a word, but uh, yeah, that the roots can easily penetrate through the soil, that it uh, remains this, yeah, that it also the, the soil gets a sponge structure kind of. Um, of course, it's a biomass uh, which also holds water, so um, everything extra we bring like biological material we bring into the soil will increase the water water holding capacity uh, yeah as i mentioned other options besides straw would be wood chips uh, wheat husk or hay and also here like a little exercise for you or um, a little to do is ask locals or local experts uh, which biomass is cheaply available in the surrounding <clears throat> okay, last two slides, um, and then we are done for today. So microorganisms are really important since they decompose organic matter and make it available to plants again. As I mentioned, they need uh, nitrogen to do this. They live mainly in the topsoil and the root zone. Um, they are also aerating the, the soil, so they, they dig through the soil and um, create little channels so that air can flow through the soil, which is then again benefic beneficial to the soil structure. Um, they are forming so-called clay humus complexes, especially worms, um, which is a very, uh, uh, yeah, how to, how to say it's a very beneficial um, form of complex of clay mineral and humus. Um, yeah. As I already also mentioned, biodiversity in the soil means always that uh, the ecosystem above will be healthy. Um, and there are different things you can do. For example, the inoculation with compost tea. Uh, I think I mentioned it last time and also I just added another video how you can produce your own compost tea. It's kind of a homework to do research on that because it's a very low-tech procedure uh, with which you can multiply uh, from a little bit of compost or forest soil you can multiply the microorganisms and also fungus uh, and spread throughout your system so that you immediately bring a lot of uh, microbiology into the soil from the beginning and mycorrhiza i think casper told you about this two weeks ago uh, is the, the name for a kind of fungi or like a, a very large group of fungi which form communities of life with, with plants. So uh, we call it a symbiosis when two organisms work together to, uh, yeah, for the benefit of both. Uh, yeah, here's just a picture of a, of a root of a plant and you see all the thin white we call them hyphae so the uh, above ground one biggest part of the mushroom uh, which is in the soil um, briefly say it like uh, the fungus supports the tree as it's growing with uh, water and nutrition which the tree itself can't access and 
the tree gives in exchange sugar, which it produces through photosynthesis. So it's really like uh, a marketplace or so that uh, different yeah, different goods are exchanged. And the symbiosis is very, very uh, important in most forest ecosystems and it provides like a lot of uh, health and biomass growth, additional biomass growth for the trees. Um, and how do we bring or support this uh, kind of fungi? Uh, one very easy low-tech method would be that you go out um, and it's off officially probably not allowed in most places, but that you look for a similar, like a, a natural forest in your region and you go out with a bucket um, and you only need a little bit, but uh, that you go out and you take some fresh forest topsoil, only only a little bit that you can uh, inoculate your system with the existing microbiology and mostly fungi. Um, <clears throat> And if you added like biomass and humus, uh, like compost and stuff already and planted all the trees, and then you just spread out the little amount of topsoil you gathered in a natural surrounding forest, then you have like already thousands of mushroom spores and uh, microorganisms that then can multiply. Um, yeah, so easy going. And uh, very last, the mulch material. Um, yeah, it's important to retain moisture in the soil, uh, prevents like uh, grasses and other weedy plants from growing. When they decompose, uh, the mulch layer forms humus, and you should consider a layer of five to eight centimeters uh, in order to. Um, yeah, to, that, that this much layer can provide all the functions we're talking about. And again, in this case, you could use straw, you can use wood chips, uh, you can use the shredded pruning of uh, shrubs and trees. So, uh, yeah, there are different materials you can use for that. And it's really a game changer, actually, for especially for the uh, maintaining of the soil moisture. Yeah, that's basically it for today. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit more technical than last time, but I hope that uh, there were already some yeah useful information for you. Next time we're going to continue with the with the other three points of the project management, and also as soon as we know more about the area, the specific area, we can um, yeah look more in detail even more in detail into uh, useful materials and so on. And um, yeah, like like a useful plan how to work on this area. Um, yeah, that's it. I think I, I gave some guiding questions and today, uh, this time it would be really nice, especially for the people of you in Gozo, if you do some research, what uh, biomass and materials are available in your area, which trees are available, which tree nurseries are around there, so that we slowly start to gather some information. And if there is a Discord channel or some kind of cloud that you start to collect this information and um, yeah, that you start to, yeah, start, start to look how, how the process can develop and how you can start to implement your tiny forest. That's basically it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, just one question. Um, Stefan, you said uh, you can. Uh, drill a hole and see the uh, the layers of the ground. Mm -hmm. As a geographer, I'm used to use a, a drill rod. You know, you take this pipe and you beat it into the air, turn it, mm -hmm. take it out again, and then you have um, a small site of the the layers. Are you using mm -hmm. that too? Um, yeah, we are using it. Uh, it 
uh, we have it here. So we are using it in some sites. Uh, really depends. I mean, in general, uh, we often like it's the low tech thing or what everyone has is just uh, uh, material to just dig a hole, you know, like the capacity to just dig a hole. But if you have these more professional tools, you should definitely, uh, it's easier to use, you know, to, easier mm -hmm. to get a deeper soil sample and um, decide and go. So anyway, it might be hard to dig a deep hole and maybe easier to get this. Uh, uh, Drill uh, rod, yeah. Straw, yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, for the plan, next week we have uh, Professor Luis Casar. I guess he's with us today, if I see it right. Uh, he will talk about the special situation in Gozo and about the plans and stuff like that. So um, next Friday, he will lead this lecture and we see Stefan again in the last lecture, lecture six, which will be in March 26. And there probably you can ask all your questions and there we will have, to, um, we'll go into the in detail on the planting uh, week we will have and how we can do this and manage this. Um, Another thing, oh, in between then, there is another lecture, of course, held by me and my colleague Rasmus, and the topics will be there, marketing and financing. So the topic will then be, how do we get money for the plans we need? Um, how do we market, uh, do it in, in marketing ways, using so social media and stuff like that? So we'll talk about that on March 22, I guess, March 22. Let me check it. March 21, sorry, on Thursday, 21, same time, 17.30. And the last lecture, lecture six on March 26 will be, this is also not a Friday, it's a Tuesday because Easter time will start then on the next weekend. Um, but I think you have the dates already. Another thing is uh, we will set up a Discord channel uh, categorized by some topics, by some themes. And uh, you can use this to get to, to get again now with each other, to talk to each other, to um, exchange infos, to ask questions about each other. Um, I will send the link tomorrow with a mail together with the new um, YouTube movie and stuff like that and the, and the PDFs we get from Stefan again. So everything tomorrow in the mail, or I don't know when um, the teachers will send it to you on Monday probably. And uh, yes, so I'm looking forward to the next week, next Friday, hearing Luis F. Casar about the Gozo situation, planting at forest in Gozo. And if you don't have any questions. Yes, I have one more. I'm sorry, yeah. I have, always have questions. No but, problem. Uh, good, good. <laughs> it's another question to Stefan. Uh, in your um, presentation uh, last week, you showed different um, tiny forests and one was uh, close to us here in Darmstadt, um, near Griesheim, I, th I think. I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure. Do you have uh, the exact position of this tiny forest? Because uh, I would like to yeah. make a little excursion with my students to visit it yeah. because it's quite near here. And then we might send... Uh, uh, some photos to Gozo um, to communicate and uh, show them a tiny forest in our region. Yeah, um, yeah, it's actually in uh, in the city center, more or less, at uh, the Berliner Allee, uh, right in front of Mercedes Niederlassung. And you find it also on Google Maps when you look up uh, tiny forest Darmstadt. It's already there. So yeah. Okay. Easy. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Very nice. Cool. All right. So we wrap it up again. And as I always say, dream of forests, <laughs> of our tiny forests. And uh, we see each other next week, I hope. So have a good night. 
And thank you to, to you, Stefan. It was a great presentation, also the last one. It is a pleasure to hear about the tiny forest and uh, to make it such interesting and passionate again. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad. To, I'm <laughs> glad yeah. So have a good evening and we'll see you next time. Okay. Yes. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a nice bye -bye. weekend.